Awesome. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the last talk of the second day of KiwiPyCon. Are you all still awake? Yes. Excellent. I'd like you, please, to join me in giving a super enthusiastic welcome to Ben Shaw, who's going to talk to us about microservices. Thank you, thank you. We good, Sam, man? Sweet. Uh, so, PyCon. I love coming to PyCon because uh, I get to think up crazy ideas and then investigate them and then hopefully do an entertaining talk for you guys. So this year, um, microservices, as it says, is HTTP the only way? Uh, this talk's kind of long, so hopefully I won't go over time, but if I do, you guys can just suck it up because you've got nowhere better to go now. So what's a microservice? I'm sure there's an official uh, definition for microservices out there, but for my purposes, I'm going to say that a microservice is an application that reads some data, processes it, and then outputs the result. Now, I'm not defining where the results get output to. Um, maybe they go to a file, maybe to a database, maybe emailed somewhere. Um, it doesn't matter. The application should operate in only one domain. And what I mean by that is in terms of like uh, the users, this microservice should, should handle user authentication or this microservice should handle uh, message storage or something like that. And the application's behavior should be simple and describable in just one sentence. So I don't want people to try and get around that by saying, uh, having a stupid long run-on sentence like this, a user can sign up and log in and post a message and follow other users and church post it. No, no, let's not do that. So what is a microservice not? Uh, I'm not including definitions that say um, a microservice needs to use only one database table. Um, if necessary, uh, you can have as many database tables as you want. Uh, I don't think that a microservice necessarily has, has to run on a different server. I don't think a, a microservice needs to be written in a different language. You can have your main service or a bunch of microservices all written in the same language. It could be easier for your dev team that way. And I, uh, the last point, which is the whole point of this talk, I don't think it's necessary for a microservice to uh, communicate over HTTP. Now in this talk, I'm not going to cover the pros and cons of using uh, microservices. This is probably one of the consequences you have. GitHub gets paid for more private repos and uh, Finder replaces harder. But it needs to be up to you as to whether microservices are, are what you're going to need for your application. So to illustrate all this stuff, I needed an example application. And uh, I've come up with something with these features. So it's just going to be a web app where users can publicly post messages. And it needs an authentication system, so users can sign up and then log in. Users will be able to follow uh, other users and receive notifications when uh, that user posts. And the maximum message length is 141 characters. So this probably sounds quite uh, similar to something you might have heard of, with one important difference. <laughs> so my service is called Uwitter, or Twitter plus one. And just to start off, I'll give you a couple of uh, screenshots. So welcome to Uwitter, post a message, hello KiwiPyCon. Uh, after I posted, um, well, you can see a list of messages, and then after I post, I get a message saying, you, you weeted. Sweet. Um, if anyone here works with Twitter, please don't sue me. In case I accidentally say Twitter or tweet in this, post, uh, in this talk, you, you know what I mean. So we start off with a monolithic application, which will then uh, break down into microservices. Starting off, it's really simple. Uh, that's the architecture of it. We have a Django server, uh, a Django front end, sorry, and a database, well, a single database to store all the stuff. And there's three main tables that we're interested in in uh, the monolith. There's a UEAT table, which will store the messages. There's a user profile table, which stores extra information about a user. In this case, all we're storing are the follower relationships, which user is uh, following which other users. And finally, there's a user table, which will store user ID, a username, and a hash of the password. And the number of, uh, the URLs that we have and, and the views that we have are also 
quite uh, simple. And we can break them up into three sort of categories. The first few there are all about viewing your eats. Uh, you can view your eat, you can post a new your eat. You can search for your eat, I wish I'd chosen a different name because it's really hard to say. You can view all the your eats for a username, uh, and you can go to this user your eats URL, which will show all the your eats of the current user that's logged in. The next uh, two URLs are for following and unfollowing. So if you post to uh, follow username, you'll add that username uh, as a follower of the logged in user. And likewise, if you hit unfollow, you'll remove it. And then there's a couple of accounts, uh, a couple of URLs dealing with accounts. So there's a register one and a, and a login URL. So next, we've got to take this monolith and uh, somehow turn it into a set of microservices. So using that, the, those three sort of URL schemes is how we're going to look at, uh, or the three ways the URLs are, are separated, is how we're going to look at monolith, uh, partitioning, partitioning the monolith. So we'll start off by moving all the UEating stuff into its own service. So the UEating microservice, its one sentence definition is that we need to store, retrieve, all or by user, and search for UEats. So it's pretty simple. We have a single database and a single message table in which we're storing the ID of the message, uh, the user ID of whoever's posted that message, the message content, and the date uh, it's been posted. Uh, this table is pretty much the same as it was in the monolith. We've sort of just taken that table and moved it into um, its own separate database. Then to actually retrieve stuff from this database, uh, I've created a a single file with all the database API stuff in it. So this is just called uh, db.py. At the top of it, uh, it's just got a bunch of SQL Alchemy DB connection stuff and uh, ORM definition for the message. And then I expose four, um, four functions or four methods for retrieving messages. So the first one is, is actually for posting a message. Uh, the second is for searching messages. It takes a search string and returns a list of messages. We can then list messages, which will retrieve all the messages in the system. Or we can just list user messages, which will list messages for a specific user. So our architecture did look like this before. And what we're going to do is separate it out uh, into uh, the message architecture, uh, the message service, which is on the right, which is going to be, we're going to talk to it over HTTP and use Flask for, for serving. So the HTTP API for that is fairly simple as well. It's a single file app, which is called app.py. I didn't bother with authentication. Uh, it's REST-ish. I'm not going to get into semantics with that. And it talks JSON. And this is basically the URLs that we're exposing for the app.py. Uh, if you get hit messages slash an integer, it'll get the user messages for that user ID. Messages search will hit that search messages function. Uh, just going to slash messages will list all the messages. And if you post to messages slash posts, it will post a message. So we take a look at the uh, Django view that we actually have for, for getting the messages uh, and rendering, rendering them. In moving to a microservice, because of the way this Django view is written, I haven't actually had to change this at all. I used a, a message, a facade, a, like a message service facade, and I can retrieve that just by calling this get message service function. And that just looks into the Django config, and depending on if you say use local messages or use a microservice, uh, it'll, re it'll pull back a different um, class. Then we just get all the UEATs with the uh, all messages function, and just send them off to the UEAT list HTML file to be rendered. So looking at this message facade a little bit more, the Django ORM one, which is the original, is at the top. And we just get all the messages using the Django ORM. Getting the uh, messages over HTTP is easy. We just use the, I, I use the request library. Uh, we get that Flask URL in JSON format. And I pull the messages out, and then 
send it through to this transform raw dict function. So due to laziness, uh, due to the demo simplicity, the transform raw dict function adds properties that the microservice return values are missing. So yeah, for simplicity, the, the microservice is just returning, for example, the user ID of the user that posted the message, but no other user information. And so this uh, transform raw dict function is going out and retrieving the, uh, the user from a local database. So in reality, what you'd probably do is have your, um, your message service return all the information that you need rather than just, um, uh, just the minimal amount. And it also looks at a date string and, and converts it to a date time object. So the advantages of talking to your microservice over HTTP is that it's well supported. Uh, there's so many libraries out there now and make it really easy just to create an HTTP interface for your app. I mean, my Flask uh, file is a, you know, only a few a dozen lines maybe. And it is the de facto solution. So I was talking to a colleague of mine and I said, I want to do a talk at, at PyCon about microservices. And he said, uh, well, what, do you use Flask to write your microservices? And I thought, well, that's interesting because people always just assume that you say microservice, you mean HTTP. And there's a reason for that. It's like the de facto solution. And you get security and authentication built in. So to secure a web app, you can chuck an SSL certificate on top of your web server and it's, it's got SSL pretty much. You're probably not going to have any networking issues. So your firewall is probably open at your organization. Um, just because HTTP is so common. And if you need to do load balancing or proxying, that's a really well uh, supported solution as well. And it's synchronous. And I view this as an advantage because you've got a synchronous request basically coming into your front end server and then you're making another request, um, a synchronous request out again. So you've sort of got this whole thing that fits together really well. You're not having to make asynchronous calls synchronously and, and that kind of thing. There's some disadvantages of HTTP though. Um, there's overhead with sending headers. May or may not be an issue though. Load balancing is not magic. What I mean by that is if you have a load balancer, you need to tell it um, what servers it should be load balancing for. And it needs to have some way of knowing which of those servers is busy and how it should be receiving messages uh, how it should be routing messages to those servers. And that's all configuration. It's not, um, it's not magic in terms of picking the server that's the best for handling the resource at, at request at that time. And I think being synchronous can also be a disadvantage, and especially if you, uh, if you have a message that um, you can handle in an asynchronous way and you're forced to wait for a response from a, a server. So that's what I want to uh, talk about next. So we go back to the partitioning. The next thing I'm going to look at is partitioning this notification service. The one sentence definition for this is that when a user posts a UEAT, we need to notify all their followers. And I'm going to do this, in this case, by using a message queue. So message queues are real simple. You put stuff on a queue, and then you have a number of workers who will read messages from the queue. And in this use case, the queue is a message sync. So a message is going into the queue and disappearing and then the front end can, can forget about it. We're not trying to read stuff back off the queue again. And I decided to use Combu as a message transport. You've probably heard of Celery and underneath Celery, and it's also part of the Celery project, but underneath Celery, uh, Combu is the message transport there. And it doesn't really matter, but in this case, I was using Redis as the message broker. Um, and I decided to use Combo instead of Celery it's because in theory, I haven't tested this, but in theory, this should allow us to be cross-platform. Cross so you can have uh, so, uh, your microservice written in a different language to, to be able to read those messages. So this is how our architecture is now. And this is what it's going to be. So the way that the message sync works is that Django will generate a notification send it off to the message queue. The message queue, uh, the notifier service will then read that notification from the message queue and then send it out somewhere. That notification is not being sent back uh, up to the Django end. Um, 
So using producing messages with, with Combo is pretty easy. Uh, I just created a producer base class which will take a message that you give it and uh, publish it onto a queue. And then I have subclass that uh, just to add this notifier post message which is just a, a sort of helper function. But all it's doing is building a message from the poster, follower and content arguments and then calling, uh, calling put message. So this, this is on the front end on the Django side. So after a message gets posted uh, in, in Django, we create a notifier, which is an instance of the notifier producer, and we tell it which connection and queue it should be using. And then for every follower uh, in the profile, we just notify that follower that, that someone's posted. Then to actually do something with this message, uh, this is on the, in the microservice side, uh, I've written this notifier service uh, file and we can just import this consumer mixin from Combo, and we can just create a, a message consumer subclassing that and we just need to implement this on message method and every time a message uh, gets read off the queue this will um, do something with the message in this case we're printing I received a message uh, in reality you'd probably want to email the user or something and then you just need to make sure that you acknowledge that message at the end, otherwise the message will get back onto the queue and get um, uh, get used again. The second part of this file is to actually run that service. So I create a connection, create an exchange and a queue from that exchange. Uh, and then I just create an instance of that notifier consumer and run it. And so every time I run one of those, it'll just sit there waiting for a message to come onto the queue. As soon as it's got a message, it'll pull that off, do whatever with the message, and then go back to waiting. If there's already another message on the queue, it'll just read it off straight away. So the advantages of, of message sync, uh, of, of a message sync, so not a back and forth message queue, but uh, somewhere where we're putting a message in and it, it disappears from us, is it's basically set and forget. You can take your message, put it into the queue, and just forget about it. And scaling up is kind of magic. By that I mean, if you need more notifiers, you can just create more notifier pro processes. And when they're not busy, they'll be reading off the queue. Um, and they won't be sort of forced to try and handle a message if they're not ready. Uh, and it's asynchronous, as I discussed before. You don't have to wait for a response to come back or anything, just fire it off. But there are some disadvantages to using a message sync. You need to have a message broker that you can communicate with. So if you've got firewalls in place or, or whatever, um, your consumer and your notifier both need to be able to talk to that message broker and uh, it's not as ubiquitous as HTTP so there might be some configuration issues there. And having this intermediary service, the broker, it does add a level of complexity for debugging. So you need some way of um, inspecting the, the broker and finding out what's going on in there if things aren't working as you expected. And a side effect of this is that it gives you a false sense of security because your application, it's your front end application, will receive confirmation that the message has gone into a queue, but there's no guarantee that there's actually a consumer um, on the other end reading off that queue. So what can we do about this last point? What can we do to make sure that we know that a message has been read and, and, uh, and has been dealt with? So we'll talk about the, the third partition here, which is the authentication and how we're going to use a message queue but be able to go back and forth with messages. So the definition of the authentication microservices, microservice is that it should store new user registrations and then authenticate them with a username and password. Again, we have a database with a single table. It stores the user's ID, username, and a password hash. And similarly to the messages service, we have a db.py file with the SQL Alchemy stuff and then three methods it exposes. A create user method, which will obviously create the user. We can authenticate the user with a username and password, which will return a user object. And we can get a user by ID, which again will return the user object. So, our architecture looks like this. When we 
add the auth service into its own microservice, it'll end up looking like this. That's kind of getting ugly. So what I didn't tell you that I did was that I also rewrote the messages service to be its own, um, to, sorry, I rewrote the messages service to communicate with the message queue as well. It was using Flask, uh, now it's using this. So our architecture looks like this. And that's quite nice because you sort of have, you got Django there and then a message queue and then a bunch of different consumers running off it. So it's real nice. You sort of have one place where you've got to send off any messages you might have or um, any kind of communication is all done this one way. So just to talk about how uh, the, the steps I needed to go through to get two-way communication working um, using this message queue. So normally we have a producer and a consumer on a queue. And the producer will say, I'm putting messages on the queue. And the consumer will say, I'm reading messages from the queue. So if the consumer wants to get uh, send a message back to the producer, it will go something like this. Here's a response, producer. Thanks for the message. Because it's, oh, it's just reading any message on the queue. So to get around that, we need to have two queues like this. Uh, a queue for sending from the producer to the cons consumer and one for sending back from the consumer to the producer. That's not quite right because we have a producer and consumer at each end. So this is actually like Django to a service and then service back to, to Django. Right, so time for some hacks. So making a message queue synchronous. As I said, we need two queues, one for requests and one for responses. So there's an auth request queue and an auth response queue with a producer and consumer at each end. So if we're going from the web front end across to a service, this is easy. Putting into a queue a number of services reading it off. Going from a number of services back to a single web process is actually kind of difficult. But we need some way of identifying which, uh, which returning message belongs to which web request that's come in. That's easy. Uh, I can, I've written a new method called message request, which will just add a message ID to any uh, message it's putting onto the queue. So it gets a request a dictionary, and then it just generates a UUID for the message ID, uh, sticks it in the request dictionary uh, before it puts it on the queue, and then it will return back the message ID. So we have a message ID, so we know which message we're waiting to get a response for. But now we need some way of waiting uh, for the response that we actually expect. So here's some more hacks. We're going to use some shared variables. So these are kind of like uh, singletons, I guess, in a way. We have a received event that we use for, for letting uh, any consumers know or any requests know that a new response has come in. And then we have a single consumer that's going to uh, consume the response and just hold on to them until they're ready for the request to pull it off. We then start the response consumer and uh, run it in a different thread. So what this response consumer actually does is receive, is store any messages that come in. So when it gets a message, it looks at the message ID and uh, stores that in a receive messages dictionary. And then it sets and clears an event so that anything that's listening for that event will know to check and see if their message has arrived. So when a web request needs to wait for a message, uh, it uses this new synchronized message call function. So it'll go off and call whatever message function it's passed in, which will give it back a message ID. Then while well, true, so you know that's going to be good. If the message ID is in the list of received messages or in the dictionary of received messages, we'll get the response, we'll pop it off that dict and then uh, return that response. Otherwise, we'll just sit there and wait for that event to be set. And as, as I said, it's the shared um, received event that we created before. So hopefully this should be setting off some alarm bells because we've got global variables, we've, which are maybe singletons, 
Uh, this will only work if you have a single Python interpreter. It has cross-thread data access, so luckily we have the GIL. Everyone's been trashing it today, but finally it comes through. And there's probably a race condition in there as well. So yeah, it turns out they're going from one service, so what I've tested going from multiple services back to one web process, that works okay. Going from multiple services back to multiple web processes, that's probably going to be a terrible mess because we rely on a, on a singleton being there to read the message. Unfortunately, all of these are running, um, are, would be reading from the same queue. So you don't know if your web process is going to, if your web message is going to be consumed by the right web process that the request has hit. So how could we make this work? Um, maybe a return queue per process, maybe dynamically creating a return queue for each request. Maybe put the results in a database and read from them. Or maybe just use Celery, because this is what it's designed for. Um, but that is provided that you have Python code running at the other end. So advantages of message queue, you get magical scaling in one direction. But for it to work, you need terrible code that works only with a single Python interpreter. Um, you have to handle your own security. You can just use Celery. So another transport we could look at using uh, is just raw sockets. So go back to our authentication architecture. It looks like this. We use, uh, again, I wrote a Flask front end that I didn't tell you about, but there's a Flask front end for authentication, which we talked to over HTTP. So all we're going to change in this example is that instead of talking to it over HTTP, we're going to use a, um, uh, use a TCP socket. So writing a socket server is pretty easy. Uh, this is basically the example code from the Python docs. Uh, you create a socket, you bind it to a port, and you have it listen. And again, this is example Python code. Um, you create a socket, you tell it to connect to a port, uh, you send it a message, you receive a message back, and you can close the socket. So all I'm doing here is sending JSON over TCP. So if you've ever done any sort of raw TCP programming before, um, you know that you need to have some kind of format to tell it how it should marshal your messages. So all I'm doing is sending four bytes at the start, which is the length of the message in ASCII. So hopefully the message is less than 9999 characters long. Um, in real life, you'd come up with something better than this. And then to receive that JSON, just read in the message length, again, by reading in four bytes, turning it back into an integer. And then until you have that number of message, um, until you have that number of bytes, just keep reading, then decode the JSON and uh, return your, your message. So raw TCP is actually, has a really, uh, is actually really easy to use. It has a low overhead. Like I said, it's easy to code the Python client. If you want to do load balancing, um, you can use something like HAProxy. Uh, and it's synchronous, so again, it kind of fits into that HTTP synchronous um, workflow type thing. There's some disadvantages, though. Uh, again, firewall issues, unless you're talking over port 80, may have to open up firewalls. Um, and you've got to DIY a lot of stuff. There is a socket server library, which does make it easier, but you do have to sort of handle your own security and threading uh, and it is synchronous, which could be a disadvantage. So I like to. So that's TCP sockets. Um, what about using UDP? So if we look at the notification microservice again, where they we're notifying users when uh, someone they're following has UETed. Maybe that's slightly less critical. So. The, the notifications that we're sending out, they don't need a response. They're just one-way message sync type thing. And if some users sometimes don't get notified of some posts, maybe, maybe that's not so bad. So what about using UDP? So before H, um, using Django to talk HTTP to Flask, let's change that. Django send UDP uh, packets to a service. So writing the UDP listener is easy. Um, I don't call it a UDP server because it's not really a server going back and forth. It's just listening for stuff coming in. Uh, the run server is slightly different. We're creating a 
um, socket underscore dgram um, instead of a TCP socket. So this is a, a UDP socket. We bind it to a port as with the TCP one and just start the message loop. So we'll true read a message from the socket and then print it out. And the receive message, receive JSON message is, um, is pretty simple. It just reads in a 1024 bytes. Again, the first four is the length of the message. Uh, it passes the rest of it as JSON and, and returns it. The UDP sender is quite easy as well. Uh, it's pretty much the same, except that we're not binding to a socket. We're, we're just creating a, a UDP socket there. Um, message sending is the same except we're not sending to a bound connection, we're just firing out a UDP packet to a machine on a port. So advantages of the UDP socket is that there's a little bit less overhead than TCP. Um, again, it's, it's easy to code. That is pretty much Python example code as well. It's faster than UDP, uh, faster than TCP, uh, and it is asynchronous. So when you want the asynchronous stuff, good, you can just dump stuff in there and forget about it. Some disadvantages, of course, as I mentioned, UDP is unreliable. And again, you've got to DIY your, uh, your stuff. Socket server, again, can make it easier. Uh, you need to roll your own security, but perhaps you could sign the message and then inspect that at the other end and make sure it was what you're expecting. Maybe that would be okay. Uh, and you have to handle your own threading. So just some other thoughts that I, um, things that I noticed while I was working on this project you sort of naturally tend towards using the facade pattern. So I had a bunch of set methods for DB access and I just switched out the transports for sort of interacting with that. So my db.py file didn't have to change. I just created, for example, an app.py file or a, uh, or a service file or whatever. So that was cool. And I noticed that I did a lot of code sharing or, or duplication. So Despite everything being in the same Git repo, I treated all these services and stuff as separate projects, and therefore I didn't want to have any cross-project imports. So the easiest thing for me to do was to copy and paste some code. So, for example, the DB creation code is, is duplicated, um, the message sending and reading code is, is duplicated, and the socket, uh, JSON socket writing stuff is duplicated. But in real life, hopefully you would, as I did, notice that was, this was happening and split your base classes and, and libraries into uh, separate projects as well and manage them separately with their own repos and, and have proper libraries and stuff. So to conclude, is HTTP the only way? No. But it's definitely the easiest. Uh, that's the end. There's a GitHub link if you're interested in looking at this, all my crazy Flask apps and stuff. Um, yeah, thanks. So, any questions? We have time for a few excellent questions. I don't want to put you all off, but it better be a good question. Anyone? Okay, it can be just an okay question. <laughs> Up the back.